for, the, for our clients to map, and then um, how those layers are turned into a, a web map that they interact with and can share with other people. <laughs> All right. There's probably going to be no more great text the rest of the presentation. <laughs> um, so, um, sorry, I'm going to go back to this because it's a little bit complicated. So they, they upload their data our, to our data system. Um, it's stored in a Postgres database, uh, PostGIS enabled. What they do with that data next is they can turn it into many layers. So they can take one, they upload an Excel spreadsheet of some data. Um, it could, and they can turn it into point data if they have addresses or latitude longitudes. And they can also turn it, they can aggregate it into, uh, into Coroplast mappable data and basically polygons by joining it using zip codes or state IDs or MSA IDs, um, et cetera. So that they can, so they can have one data set and they can have multiple different layers filtered different ways created from that data set um, just with PostGIS. And then they can add layers to a, to a web map view and do filtering within that map and styling to, to, their, to their liking. So I'm going to step through the process somewhat quickly of how they, how they do that and see where Cardo CSS and the UTF grids kind of come into play and let us uh, super fast style and view many, many points or polygons. Um, there's a data manager. They simply click a add new data button once they're logged in. And they get to upload an Excel or a CSV file. Um, they have us add little things like using FTP, so it's in really small print, but it's a private client, it's a pr private application, so it's, that's why the little things like that are there. Um, so when they upload an Excel file, they get this little dialog once it uploads successfully. And uh, we make a rough attempt to really broadly categorize the data for them. We'll, we'll put things in more precisely as, as doubles or integers if we can, but we just want them to be able to choose between numeric and text data. Um, I think we have a Boolean option as well um, so that they can categorize and map their data the way they want to. So when we try to auto set colors or, or categories, we're doing the right thing. We're sizing um, or coloring qualitatively instead of quantitatively or the other way around where appropriate. So they can just click these and change the, uh, change the data type. So they got this Excel file. This one, I, I guess I uploaded some census track data. So it auto, auto fills tracks as the name and the data that it, it's processed from a tracks.xlsx as a description. And then they can share it with different groups within their company. So they have a checkboxes. They can keep it private, or they can let other people have access to it. And then people with access to it can make new layers, make maps, download the data, et cetera. But they can't delete it if it's, if it's your data. So it's uploaded. It's in a data set. So that's that first can. They haven't made a layer out of it. It's just, it's just flat data, no uh, geometry column or anything in the PostGIS database. And this is where they can kind of choose what to do. You're not seeing all the options there, but they can do a point, a point layer from a, a latitude longitude that exists, or they can do geocoding, or they can do choropleth layer. So they're actually going to make me take choropleth away. I, there's the cartographer in my. Could not write heat map for what is actually appropriately a choropleth map, but they, uh, they, 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 I have to remove that. So a little bar, bit of my cartographer soul is going to suffer, but that's okay. They're happy. Um, so we're, we're, from this data, we're creating a point layer um, from tracks, and again, very similar. Now this is a data layer. This is going to be, this is going to have a latitude field and a longitude field, and we try to find a latitude and longitude field in there. And then that's used to create the layer. And that creating the layer process, um, Randall may mentioned uh, views in PostGRESS. And we actually use materialized views, which is, have worked really well. I didn't even know about these before we started this project. What a materialized view is in PostGRESS is it's a query, which is what a view is. Um, but the materialized ones, it actually creates the table, so it's in, in the database. If, a, if it's just a view, you, you're making the table every time you try to look at it. It's running the entire query, whereas if it's a materialized view, it's there and accessible very quickly. So we can render tiles quickly uh, based on that uh, PostGIS 
data. So from here, I'm just taking a look at the data. This, this tracks data had 826 items. Um, it's processed from that file. It tells you who owns it, when it was last updated, and how many layers have been made out of it. So we saw we made that one layer, and that's the only layer that's made out of it. And so we can add, we can make multiple layers. We can make another point layer, or a heat map layer, or whatever we want. So I'm going to look at a different one because it's a little more interesting. It's 70,000 records, so which isn't trivial if you're trying to render it as um, vectors. So that's why we're doing the tile thing and, and provide this to them. Um, and they don't want to have things clustered. They want to be able to see every point and drill down. And, and that's, their, that's their choice. Um, so we can add it to the map. It just comes in as 70,000 points on a map. Um, unstyled, uh, nothing exciting. It says new view there, so that's the third step in that process that goes from database to layer to view. Um, so this is a new view. It hasn't been saved, hasn't been styled, but it renders these 70 some th odd thousand points uh, really quick, and that's thanks to uh, Windshaft, which is which is an awesome uh, little server and has helped us a great deal. And it Windshaft pumps out these very nice tiles, so nice 256 by 256 PNG um, that we can render on top of our base map, and these, these are unstyled. They're not smart. They don't have any rollover information. They're just, they're just the PNGs. They're just tiles, and uh, they're rendered on the fly, so these are non-cached because they, do, they just interact with them all the time, so they don't, it doesn't make sense to, to cache them that much. Um, that's probably really small, but that's the query that's sent to the Windshaft map tile server to render those PNGs. Um, I'll have a couple more of these that are hopefully a little easier to read um, later on. But what about styling? So this is what they want to do. They want to style things right away. They have tens of thousands of points, other data, that, and they want to style things. So here we're picking a categorical um, field, and we're going to color by that field. And we kind of we auto pick colors for them, and they can change them or whatever. But uh, but you know I wish it was live because if so I could trust if I could trust the internet. But um, it renders the tiles really quickly. These have been set to some color standard that they wanted, and you can see over here, just like the other PNG, um, we're rendering map tiles out of those same seventy thousand points. And you can see on this one, I've highlighted a little spot. It's, uh, it's just one of the categories where it says if you know Cardo CSS at all, it says delivery type equals three P marker fill, and it gives you the marker fill that you want to use. So it's in the query string for the tile how you want to style it using CSS, and it just it goes and it uh, does it lickety-split. So interactivity is the other thing we want. We have 70,000 points there to look at. Um, how are we going to make it interactive? Um, and that's where UTF grids come in. Oh my gosh, who knew? Those are, UTF grids are awesome. Um, and they make it possible for us to have an interactive point layer of 70,000 points. Um, and what ETF grids are basically JSON. You can see this array here on the right side is basically a representation of a preview of the, of the uh, grid that's returned as a tile that's invisible but usable by the map to get garner information about the, uh, about the overlay. So you can see customer numbers here. Um, and that's the one interactivity item we set. And you can see that it's showing up in the top right of the map as if I'm rolling over something. And this is what uh, the text looks like. It's just a snippet of the JSON. And it just encodes to each pixel of those 256 by 256 pixels a character that gets used to identify which of the data data points in the keys down there go along with each pixel. So filter. So those are two things we can do. Super fast. It's in the URL string. We've styled it, and we've um, we've gotten rollover information from two different from CS, Cardo CSS and UTF grids. So the other thing they want to do, and what they do a lot, is filtering the data. So they want to look at some things sometimes, some things other times. Look at it with different people. Um, so we need to filter that data as well. And so another thing that 
is a, a part of WinShaft and built in is being able to make SQL queries within that tile, query, tile string. So here are all three of those categories, the three P, D, D, L, H delivery types over in that left-hand kind of list. And if we uncheck a couple of them, what it does is it re-renders the tile. Same thing as before. It's just re-rendering them based on a tile request. And in that tile request is a SQL query, just a straight SQL select star from the crazy unique ID name database where yada yada is uh, whatever you want it to be. And because these are materialized views and you're not hitting a view that has to be, the whole query has to run, it, it renders them very quickly. So <laughs> next time, next time uh, you get to save the view here. Um, and this is where we start to get a little bit collaborative. You can already share your data with other people or your layers with other people, but saving a view, which is basically a collection of those layers, the styles applied to it, the extent of the map, m multiple layers added to the map, um, then you can share that with other people. So we have a display name and a description, and then you can add collaborators. And that's where you can give other people in your business the ability to go in and edit the map, look at it, make notes or changes. Um, and so we can all be kind of working on the same thing from different places um, easily. So that's a very, very simple type of collaboration, but it is, it is a collaborative for them. And there's, there's a lot more, and I rushed through that, so if there's anything interesting in that part, um, feel free to ask me after, after the talk. Um, this is my favorite GIF analogy for FOSS that I've come up with since I've started using fos g You know, I'm just like I'm a propeller plane, and then the FOSS community is just kind of these t attaching rockets to your propeller plane. You know, you're just like <laughs> taking off super faster than you would have um, otherwise and able to do things that you wouldn't necessarily have been able to do otherwise without more time and uh, effort than you had available. So in uh, getting this ready to go, this old project, I really, you know, I felt like I was a consumer of these open source projects and it was, they were so cool and we wanted to do something, give back in some way. So our next project that what we're doing now is kind of that project except available for people to use and it's gonna be, it's gonna be open source and, you know, freely available to, uh, to for folks to use. We're calling it WeMap right now just because the idea is to be very collaborative um, and let people edit the same map instead of have it be be, uh, be private. And take a look at another uh, page here. This is just a mock-up of, of what it looks like right now. Um, so this is this is fake interactivity, but this is a website sign in um, just like anywhere, uh, and you get your projects page. Um, so we're trimming it down so it's not you know it was pretty complicated that last one where you have one data set, then you make a bunch of layers, and then there's views and People kind of get lost in all that, all the words in the lingo. So, <laughs> sorry, guys. Let me let me close that email. I'm one of the many email people. I have not gotten my email box to zero yet. Um, so, so I have my three projects, and it has my little who's involved in the project, so all your little collaborators, the people you're working with on this individual map, um, people working on this map, you can make a new project. And then separately you have your data set, um, your data set. So we're stripping away our uploading and hosting of, of data and putting hooks into um, Box and Dropbox um, to be able to connect to your data sets so that when you do update them, they, those updates get pulled into the database um, through through the webhooks that are available there, and we don't have to worry about the, that whole upload process and and being being stewards in that way. Um, I'm going to go back to the projects and pretend we do a new project and just a standard map view where you can start doing things. Um, you can change the base map. Like I said, this is this is a mock-up, but um, Oops.
So yeah, change the base map there. Um, and we want to provide a place where you can enter a URL for a map tile provider that you like, um, just because there's, there's so many good ones out there. And you, if you make your own somewhere else, um, roll them in there. And then adding data layers. So a simple way to just get to that data menu that you have. And it has your different data sets that you have uh, uploaded or saved. Um, and then let's go back to an existing project. And so this is just a silly, like these are fake circles drawn on a map, um, made up data. But the idea of what we want it to be is collaborative so that um, you can make comments and you can talk about, talk about the map with your collaborators. So we have a little place for comments and they're, they're spatial. So we're, we're making them spatial comments. So if you, if you click on a comment, my comment is about this location. I want to make a note about this location that we can go back and reference later. So we have this stored as kind of a running um, JSON of the commentary. Additionally, we wanted to have uh, spatial notes. So basically graffiti for your map. Um, so line drawing, this is just um, the leaflet, the draw plugin um, toolbar. And what it will let you do is make some drawings. So if we go to look at it, a little eyeball on a pen there for now, but people have drawn and done their graffiti on the map. You can go and click on it and see what the person's comment was again and, uh, and then get out of there. So a couple different modes of comments in this mock-up. But th what we wanted people to be able to do was edit a map, have their other editors of the map, and have it all be, be saved in one place and have that history of comments and discussion uh, continue. I think I blazed through that um, because I got a little thrown off by my <laughs> slides not working in the beginning. Um, but so we're already starting with this new project to give back just a little bit. We have one of our developers contributing to Windshaft uh, on GitHub, which was nice to see. Um, and that's our whole whole goal is to be able to give back and open this up uh, once we get it once we get it rolling. Um, you can sign up to learn more. Uh, take a look at this placeholder. Um, all, all we're going to do is email people when we make it available. Um, if you do, put your email in there, and then, uh, and then we can get some people testing it as, as, as soon as possible. So here's some links. Uh, this, is, this is me on the Twitter, and then me at work, and a link to the presentation um, that you can use. And then, of course, the, the WeMap uh, link. Oops, sorry guys. So yeah, I guess I didn't need to rush as much as I thought I, ha I did. But uh, does anyone have any questions about any of that that I talked about so far? For, no, it's a, it's a mix of JavaScript and, and PHP, but it's all roll your own. Yeah. OK, anybody else? Yeah, uh, so for, for this, it's actually, it's uh, mapbox.js, um, which it wraps up leaflet. But uh, mapbox provides built-in UTF grid support that works really well. And so that integrating that with the Windshaft um, UTF grids was, was super simple. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks, guys. Oh. I have a question, actually. How, how did you uh, choose the tool for this project? Do, uh, <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. Lots of them. We, so this client, actually, I had this picture in the presentation before of the Winchester Mystery House. This client we've been working with uh, for a very long time, and we tend to build these projects that kind of get added upon and added upon and added upon and added upon. So we had all these different pieces that were written in, I mean, back to Flash API for Google Maps. And we had things, uh, you know, in 
just PHP and JavaScript, but we had we had some simple maps that were um, that were at using leaflet and and mapping, and then we wanted to do this storage, um, and we found that the best database for that was PostGIS, Postgres, um, and a way to serve that. We wanted a way to serve it that was a simple tile server that we could then we could contain and use in other projects, and so make our own you know tile server, and that's how we came. Up. We found Windshaft, and and it was it was when we when we did this it was challenging to set up for me who was not used to working in a Linux environment, um, but uh, but it it worked really well. So I guess luck and <laughs> Luck and um, and time researching were the two things that helped us get the right set of tools, which is, yeah. Yeah, I thought it was interesting that you used Cutter to use infrastructure for the back end and the Mapbox for the front end. <laughs> yeah, they, they gotta, you got to work together. <laughs> yeah, and, it's, and they, uh, I think that the, for me, Mapbox on the front end was the e easy UTF grid integration, and I, I know CardoDB.js has a similar, but it had some other things that were getting in the way of parts that we had built already. So that's the Mapbox JS wrapper of Leaflet seemed a little less um, in the way of some of the stuff that we're doing. All right. Thank you, guys, unless there's something else. Go ahead. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>